What is going on? You are listening to Tags Podcast, aka Talk About Gay Sex Podcast. I'm your host, Stevie. As we round out 2022, when I record this on Tuesday, December 27th, hope everybody had a very happy holiday weekend and looking forward to 2023 but before we get there i wanted to put together a best of 2022 tags special guests and on this episode you're gonna hear clips from some of my favorite special guests on tags podcast starting out with gay guru brian madigan and i put together some of the best of his clips where he talks about open relationships how to navigate through that and I think you're really gonna like what he has to say then we move on to author of the book damn shame loved talking to David Pevsner so great who was an actor who then turned into an escort and who now has an only fans page really great storytelling by david pevsner and lastly we visit with uncle b one of my other favorite episodes of 2022 who's going to talk about testosterone eating right and lasting longer in bed enjoy these episodes as they were some of my favorite special guests of the past year let's get started with gay guru brian madigan welcome to tags podcast thanks i'm excited to be here it's gonna be fun Absolutely, absolutely. I, I'll, I'll start the conversation going. Okay, you, sure. um, you're a life coach, but you call yourself a gay transformational coach. How, how do you describe that, and how does that differ from traditional, say, life coaching? So, if we look at traditional life coaching, we're really talking about advice giving, giving that sort of external perspective, sort of helping people see their lives in a bigger picture and helping them piece things together. The transformational coaching piece does that, but it also It sort of takes a look at where you are now, where you want to go, and how we get you there. But through looking at things like negative emotions that are impacting you, unlimiting beliefs that are causing you to relate to the world or to yourself in ways that aren't particularly good, conflicting values, things that you know are important now, but maybe conflict with religious values you were brought up with, or or those kinds of things. And particularly, that's particularly especially with gay men, there's a lot of that kind of religious programming that we have to overcome Mm -hmm. in order for us to actually be able to get ourselves on that path towards what we really want. And sometimes even know what it is that we actually really want. So getting all of that sort of negative programming out of the way before we start trying to set goals and trying to figure out how to get you there because we want Mm -hmm. you actually congruent as a full human being, knowing what it is that you really want and having the power to get there without all of that stuff in the way. And so many of us gay men come with so much baggage and trauma. And you heard us talk just a minute ago about 2 to 22 and the significance and people looking for love right now. What I know you work with people wanting to look for love and relationships. What can you, we did a funny story the other day on a whole list of references that was some, somewhat tongue in cheek, Cody. Do you remember mm-hmm. the list on what oh, I, I wrote in the oh, Reddit yeah. thread? I and, remember what you said specifically. Well, yeah, yeah I, well, I mean, <laughs> and some people wrote things like six figures and, and you know, I wrote, you know, I wanted like a huge 10 inch dick is all these kinds <laughs> of things. <laughs> Who does it? Right. But what, how do you work? Tell us a little bit about working with your clients clients who are looking for love, particularly during this month of like love. Yeah. So I think that, you know, we're all knowing what we, what we want. Okay. We're all yeah. going to, he's got to have the perfect body. He's got to have the big dick and it's all this superficial stuff. There's nothing wrong with that. That yeah. stuff needs to be on the table, but it's really not everything. And I think that's the biggest piece that people miss. So it's like, for me, it's not like, I don't want to know what, what you're looking for. Let's talk about who you're looking for. Who is yes. that person? What's he like? And not what does he do for a living necessarily, although if you have passions in certain areas, those are going to be important. Because when it comes down to it, 
you know, at the beginning, we can fall in love with just about anybody. That rush of new relationship energy. I mean, you're 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 going to go for anybody who just triggers that in you, right? And right. none of us really care what he's really like. It doesn't matter. But you know, as you move and things get more serious and start to get to know each other, if you want to actually survive long term, you kind of have to have values that match, that sort of make sense together, that work with one another. Not all of them. You want differences to create challenges and help each other to grow, but there have of common values. You want to be looking for some of the same things in life so that you know that you've got this potential to build a life with somebody. And that's a piece that a lot of us miss. Uh, and, you know, I think it, it speaks to this open relationship thing as well. Like relationship style is one of those things. People don't put it on the table. And the reality mm -hmm. is if you need monogamy and your guy needs an open relationship, you've got a big mm -hmm. chasm to cross to figure out if you can make that relationship compatible. So it's looking wow, a little that... bit deeper at what you really want, you know? Well, here's a question so just based on what you were just saying right now. How would you coach somebody if... I am going on all these dates, but I'm not meeting somebody that's compatible for me. What would be, how would you direct somebody? First of all, figure out what figure out what it is that you're really looking for. Uh, you know, a lot mm -hmm. of us go out, we go on a bunch of dates, we feel the guy's not compatible, but we don't really know why. So you're missing a piece, right? Knowing that the mm -hmm. guy's not compatible is great, but knowing why the guy isn't a better idea of, why am I not like, am I looking in the wrong places? You know, am I jumping on grinder thinking I'm going to find true love? Not that it can't happen, but let's be honest. Happy you know, and you just <laughs> happened to Cody. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> I met mine in a lineup at a bar. So. Oh, hey. A lineup. <laughs> a lineup. Yeah. The sidewalk nice. sale. Well, maybe the, nothing better the to sidewalk do than sale. Yeah. In front of you. you never know. <laughs> so, yeah, I think it's really helping them under, helping anybody understand why wasn't that day great what was it about him that didn't work so you can try mm -hmm. try to if you understand better what you're looking for you're going to actually start to naturally filter for people who are going to be a better match for you and again it comes down to those deeper things it's not just about the way he looks sexual chemistry obviously is really important yeah. particularly for men but that's easy enough to find the rest of it, not so much. And so that compatibility, it's really, are you only looking at the superficial stuff? Like if the superficial stuff is good enough, maybe take a deep breath and see where it goes. Like nice. That. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. I, I love your your approach to coaching. What really brought you to coaching and coaching gay men specifically? Um, I did a long, tiresome career in corporate information technology that was soul sucking and not working. And finally, a mm -hmm. moment where I just I was I had enough in my career, in my financial life that I could say, you know, what, I'm just going to stop. I need to figure out what I want to do. Spent a couple of years doing that, then started decided that, you know, coaching is what I really want to do. I do energy healing and all sorts of other stuff as well. But that's really where I felt this is where I'm really making changes in people's lives. And for a while, I really worked mainly with women, kind of 40s, 50s, sort of my generation mm -hmm. of women. It was really nice. But I mm -hmm. thought, you know, my people need me. Like, I really need yeah. to be a voice yeah, for a different that. way of looking okay. at life as a gay man. At looking at love as a gay man, career as a gay man. And I wanted to bring that to the table. And I think that's where the whole idea of gay guru came up. There's a, I have a very strong sort of spiritual side to me as well. And I really wanted to bring all of that stuff. I want us to learn to be more rounded human beings, you know. I yeah. think it's great that we're sex positive. That's a big, huge gift that we give to the world. It is. But it can't yeah. be everything that we are. That's and I think be. people yeah. get lost in it, Not right? Sustainable. Yeah. Oh, I right. totally, totally, totally agree. Um, so since we're talking about open relationships and and I always get a little bit confused as far as like polyamory and open relationships. What do you see as the difference between the two as far as open relationships are on polyamory are concerned? I don't think there's really a difference. I think it's really just generational terminology. And honestly, it's straight terminology and, and oh. somewhat queer and gay terminology. Like we love to talk about open relationships. A lot of straight folk who are kind of in that same mode are talking about being polyamorous and all of those kinds of things. And it all comes down to really personal definitions, right? Like what's yeah. an open relationship? Completely different thing to different people. What's polyamorous? Cameras, completely different things to different people. For me, I identify as poly. For me, being oh, polyamorous nice. simply means that I can love more than one person, romantically yeah. love, hold them both in my heart, have them in appropriate balance. And I think a big piece for me is not to so, get so carried away with that new relationship energy that my other relationship dies because I think I'm in love with the guy, right? Yeah. Um, so that for me is what my definition is. And for mm -hmm. me, open relationship is about finding relationships. 
I like oh, okay. I want I like to relate to people. I want something a little long lasting, a little more than a fuck buddy, a little more than a friend with benefits, but not a partner. Somewhere in there, right? And finding okay. that some kind of compatibility. That's how I define them. My husband doesn't consider mm -hmm. himself poly, although he ended up with a boyfriend, so maybe he is. <laughs> oh. um, and, he, and when we embarked oh, on this journey together, he said, well, you know, I just want sports sex. Like, I just want to go out and have fun. I'm like, okay, go out and have fun. Are you okay with me going out and having relationships? Because I get that that's going to be a little scarier and more challenging. Yeah. He's like, oh, I think wow. we can figure that out, but, you know, we'll have to sort of figure that out. And then a couple of years later, he randomly ended up with a boyfriend. And okay. together for a few years. Now it's a long distance thing. Um, I've met him. He's awesome. I, and I, I totally get it. And, you know, I told, I was really fun after I met him. I met him about nine months into their relationship. We went out for a drink because I felt hubby there was just not going to help the situation. Okay. Uh, sitting down, having a cocktail. And I, and I walked out of the meeting and I texted my husband and I just said, hey, you know what? If he wasn't your boyfriend, we would probably be end, end up being friends. So maybe that's going to happen one day because it's really great. So for sweet. some people, though, that's all, you know, for some people, polyamory is about a third in the relationship or a fourth yeah. in the relationship. Yeah. So it's really, it's, it's up to, that's why it's so confusing because everybody has a different definition of what it means. And I think that's important. I agree. It's your personal definition. Well, it sounds like for you, I mean, it, your husband is so fortunate to be with somebody like you, a, a, a transformational coach that can handle this. And you guys have these converse, conversations. Do you think a lot of people go into open relationships kind of not really thinking it through on what that means? I, we were just talking about a guy on the show the other day that he has an OnlyFans and they started off mm -hmm. monogamous and then they went into open an open relationship, and then they're moving on to um, polyamorous after that. But do you think a lot of people maybe where people get into a little trouble is they don't think it through of the, what it really means to go into an open relationship? They don't think it through at all. I'm a big fan of a while of monogamy, and I don't I don't preach this to people because people have to be where they're at. Personally, I find that a period of time being monogamous helps solidify the relationship and for me, builds the security I need to then be able to open up and not be completely like at sea, trying to figure out how to emotionally navigate the jealousy and the anxiety and all the stuff that comes with it because it comes wow. with it. There's challenges yeah. Yeah. that come with it and you can't pretend that those challenges aren't going to be there and that's important. But I think the biggest mistake people make is they go to the table it's usually one partner goes to the table and says they want an open relationship and they haven't figured out what it means for themselves yet mm -hmm. you have to yeah. know what you actually mean by that so that you can go to the table and say okay this is what i i want an open and what i mean by open relationship is this is how i'd like to see things for myself okay and then give your partner a moment to digest it and maybe a whole lot of moments to go off and figure out Number one, can they deal with what you're asking for? And number two, wow. if they want to open, what does it mean to them? And that's kind of the way it happened with my husband and I. Like, we stepped back and I said, this is what I want. He's like, oh, boy. I said, yeah, I know it's a lot. So we have to figure <laughs> out whether that can work. But I also want you to think about, you know, we'd been together like 10 years. And it was kind of like, it was time for both of us. And I think we both knew it, but we were both afraid to have the conversation. And he went mm -hmm. back and started thinking about it and thinking about what he wanted to do and those kinds of things. And then we had to come to the table. His issues were obviously mainly emotional. I'm worried about mm -hmm. you leaving me. I'm worried about you finding, you know, the next love of your oh, life. Wow. How are we going to deal with that? Mine were more, okay, I'm worried about STIs. I'm worrying about you being responsible. <laughs> the sexually. practical. You're going to yeah, come into family. <laughs> well, because if you just was really looking to yeah. go out and get late so you know let's yeah. have it let's have it let's make sure we're both comfortable and we know what we're doing um mm -hmm. and then when he met when he met his boyfriend it was kind of like whoa okay it, and i didn't handle it particularly well because i wasn't expecting oh. that he wasn't looking for it that i wasn't so expecting it and i was shocked i'm like hold on you're the one who said you didn't want another relationship you couldn't handle yeah. another relationship but now all of a sudden you've got this other relationship whoa what are we doing here like we got to take a step back and i got to understand what's going on right and there wow. was some you know i felt a part of me felt that trust might have been broken a little bit i don't think that's really what happened it really was random but it took a while for me to receive that and say okay you know what this was a random occurrence he just happened to find this guy who's really cool and interesting and fun for him very very different from him it's been really good for him actually and we've come mm -hmm. to a point now after it was they've been together 
a few years. I have a lover who's kind of an on and off again. I don't know really what it is anymore, but, and we've been a couple of years and we've gotten to a point now where we're actually able to have conversations and, and help each other with the challenges mm -hmm. we're having in our relationships, which is really cool. Okay. And it's a really, it's brought us to a much deeper level in our own relationship. Um, Silas has a question listening to us live right now. And he says, how yes. would one work through those insecurities that you have? Like, good question, I think, yeah. that come up. Own your stuff. Own your insecurities. Really understand why you're insecure, why you're feeling insecure. Don't it's very, very important. Don't blame your partner for your insecurities. However, important to communicate that you're feeling insecure and important for your partner to honor that and to say, okay, maybe we need to take a step back and take a break from this while you figure out what that's about for you. Is it that you feel threatened? It, you know, why are you insecure? Why is this happening? So you can help, we can help you figure this out and then we can sort of move on again. Um, I think that don't go into this thinking that everything's going to be fine and nobody's going to have a problem because there's going to be challenges and you need to yeah. be able to take a step back and say, this is the primary relationship. This is the relationship we're trying to preserve. We need to honor each other and respect each other and love each other enough to deal with those insecurities in a healthy way. And when you don't just honestly say you didn't, I, I behaved like a dick. I Sorry. I, I wasn't <laughs> appropriate. Yeah. I was mean. Yeah. I was, nasty i blew up i did whatever made a scene in the middle of a bar whatever sorry i did that and that's how i was feeling and i you know hopefully you can build a bridge and understand what's going on it's a tremendously powerful potential for growth to Beautiful. navigate the, the the ins and outs of, of any kind of open relationship Awesome. So it seems like we've took some time to cover what the challenges are. What do you see as some of the benefits to an, an open relationship or a polyamorous relationship? I think that everybody goes into that looking for something. Okay. Um, you know, like my husband was looking for variety. Our sex life was great. It's not that it wasn't happening, but he's mm -hmm. looking for variety. Some people at a certain point in time, particularly if one partner is much more sexual than the other, there's just a need, there's a need, there's a physical need that's not being fulfilled. And that can be a reasonable motivation to, to mm -hmm. open up a relationship. Some people like me are looking for a different kind of person. My husband's like a go, 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 go. Never wants to sit down and watch Netflix, man. I want a boyfriend who just wants to sit and watch Netflix <laughs> for a Saturday night, order in some food and just chill yeah, out. Right. You know? And that's the polyamorous okay. side of it that you're referencing. That's the polyamorous, that's the yeah. polyamorous side. Yeah. Yeah. But that can be that's a good difference, too. yeah. Like it, the terms are kind of interchangeable, right? Sure. But yeah, sure. that's that's really for me. For me, that's what polyamory is about. Like, I want that relationship. I want like a nice guy that I can snuggle with and watch TV and have some fun sex and we can have a good time together and have that relaxing, chilled out environment that I don't get with my husband that he doesn't want. I mean, he's tried. He really has. Yeah. He's got skinny yeah. and miserable and crazy. And like, I can't be running around with him the way he wants to run around all the time. I need a lot more downtime. And so it's like, okay, you go do your thing. And, you know, and he, he has found someone very much like him who's go, 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 go. And they keep up with each other. And it's kind of, okay. Rules will always be broken. I think that rules are the death knell in an open relationship. Ooh, the only rule no. can be two rules, communication and respect. That's it. Yes. I love communicate it. Communicate and you respect each that. other. You're good to go. Everything else is just going to get complicated and confusing. And someone's going to break the rules. And someone else is going to get pissed off. And it's just not going to work. And then there's the don't ask, don't tell thing. We have so many friends who are in this don't wow. ask, don't tell situation. And it's kind of like, okay, you don't you ask and he doesn't idea. tell, but eventually <laughs> someone else is going to tell you. And what are you going to do? How well, are you going to feel had, when and... one of your friends says, oh, I just saw, I saw your husband out with this guy and they were clearly together. Anyway, it's really important for people to respect the level of communication that their partner needs as well. So, you know, we, we don't want don't ask, don't tell, but we don't want, like, I, I'm a terrible oversharer. <laughs> really, really, really. That's why we invited you on the show. I know, I you really make good TV. Yeah. And so, you know, and, my, and my husband is definitely not. He is a very pulled back, kind of not really okay. comfortable communicating about emotions and sexuality. And so, you know, we had to figure out how do we do this? Like how yeah. much do you need to know and how much do I need to not be sharing so that we've got solid enough boundaries that we can manage it, but nobody's getting upset or freaked out or getting having horrible TMI information. Yeah. <laughs> They're going, oh, no, no, stop it. I don't want more. And we have learned to shut each other down. So sometimes it's like, you know what? We've talked about him for the last hour. 
we need to shut this down now. I'm <laughs> we're done talking about your other relationship. I think it's I think it's you know it's it's not for the faint of heart, but it's something that can be done. And yeah, you're right. Everybody has to be willing to come to the table, to be an adult, to work to do the work they need to do to get through their own stuff and yeah. then to really make the partnership a focus and see the good things that is brought to the partnership by the other things that are going on outside it, just like in anything else in life, right? This podcast is sponsored by Better Help. Hey guys, your buddy Stevie here and boy, 2022 really threw me some curveballs. Starting off with my broken ankle. That's right. I had surgery at the beginning of the year in January. And I have to say, recovery and physical therapy had me out until f at least five months. Well, the end of the year has been a little bit complicated for me as well as I had an upper respiratory infection for the last month, keeping me from doing many of the things that I really wanted to do, like travel. You know, there really is no blueprint to life when you're thrown so many lemons like I have been this past year, and that's why BetterHelp is such a great option for so many of us. Unfortunately, life doesn't come with a user manual, so when it's not working for you, it's normal to feel stuck. Navigating any of life's challenges can make you feel unsure, whether it's a career change, a new relationship, or becoming a parent. Therapists are trained to help you figure out the cause of challenging emotions and learn productive coping skills, which makes therapy the closest thing to a guided tour of the complex engine called you. You know, therapy really can be a powerful tool. I can speak from experience. It really has been for me. You know, it can really help you get over that hump, push forward so you aren't stuck, especially in your mind. And in my case, it helped me with couples therapy. I can remember I went with my boyfriend at the time and we were not seeing eye to eye. We were arguing all the time. One of the things that therapy helped us do was to communicate better, actually give us the tools to communicate better, to see our differences and ultimately respect each other and respect where each person was coming from. I can't... Sp explain that enough. It was really huge. As the world's largest therapy service, BetterHelp has matched 3 million people with professionally licensed and vetted therapists available 100% online. Plus, it's affordable. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to match with a therapist. If things aren't clicking, you can easily switch to a new therapist anytime. It really couldn't be simpler. I went on there and you can even choose for LGBTQ therapists. There's no waiting rooms, no traffic, no endless searching for the right therapist. I also like that you can do it in the comfort of your home. So learn more and save 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash tags, T-A-G-S. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P, dot com slash tags, T-A-G-S. Hey guys, Stevie here. And you know, we all know how important a good night's rest is, how important sleep is for sanity, to be productive every day. I certainly do. And for the last several weeks, I've been so happy to try my brand new Helix mattress. Let me tell you, I have been getting some of the best sleep and waking up refreshed, although I could stay in bed for hours because this mattress is so comfortable to my body. I just know whoever I bring into my bed soon, is I'm not going to be able to get them out. I took the Helix sleep quiz and I was matched with the Midnight Mattress because I really wanted something that felt medium to firm as I tend to sleep on my side and my back all night. You know, the mattress that I had before was fine, but I'd had it way too long. And then I put this foam covering on top of it that worked for a while, but it got so mushy and I was waking up with aches and pains. The Helix Matrix is a major upgrade. 
No longer do I need an extra padding because it's built in and I'm getting some of the best sleep of my life. Not only is the mattress the best I've slept on, but the setup was fast and easy. Helix mattresses are delivered in a box and straight to your door for free. Helix Sleep is a premium mattress brand that provides tailored mattresses based on your unique sleep preferences. The Helix lineup includes 14 unique mattresses, including a collection of luxury models, a mattress for big and tall sleepers, and even a mattress made just for kids. Simply take the Helix Sleep Quiz and find your perfect mattress in under two minutes. Helix knows there's no better way to test out a new mattress than by sleeping on it in your own home. That's why they offer a 100-night risk-free trial. Try out your new Helix mattress, see how your body adjusts, and if you decide it's not the best fit, you're welcome to return it for a full refund. Everybody is unique and everyone sleeps differently. That's why Helix has several mattress models to choose from, each designed for specific sleep positions and feel preferences. Models with memory foam layers to provide optimal pressure relief if you sleep on your side. Models with the more responsive foam to cradle your body for essential support in stomach and back sleeping positions. Plus, enhanced cooling features to keep you from overheating at night. Every Helix mattress has a hybrid design combining individually wrapped steel coils in the base with premium foam layers on top. It's the perfect combination of comfort and support. Helix is offering up to $200 off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners. Go to helixsleep.com slash tags t-a-g-s and you know by supporting helix you're also allowing them to support tags podcast so go purchase your helix and thank me later for your best night's sleep with helix better sleep starts now again it's helixsleep.com forward slash tags t-a-g-s all right well let's check in with one of my other favorite special guests of tags podcast this past year david pevsner just a huge huge big thank you for writing this book and one of the lines that towards the end of the book is that i talk about how i've dealt with body shame and i say that as a kid i covered up but as an adult i stripped down and it was yeah. both, and they were both kind of what i needed to do you know, in order to just preserve my sanity in a way, because body shame is really pervasive. It's awful. And when you have it, you know, and, and bring it into your adult years, it becomes even more complicated, you know, and, and it's just something that I have always been aware of my whole life. I, if, if there's one, except for wanting to like sing and dance and entertain people, my connection with my body and how I felt about it has been a lifelong journey. Um, I want to move on to sex because that's a fun topic. Yay! Uh, yeah. Um, on the end of page 71, you write, um, this is after, I believe, uh, your, one of your first, Stan, who was your boyfriend, one mm -hmm. of your first boyfriends, correct? Yeah, very first. Yeah. And you write, um, it's ending. Your relationship with Stan is ending. And you write, however, I put his name, you, you, you put Stan's name in an empty journal. His was the first in what was going to be my record of everyone I ever slept with in my entire life. And that is part of a song called Book of Lust. Yes. Which um, you write, see this massive volume. It's my comprehens comprehensive listing of everyone from 40 years of boyfriends, tricks, and trysting. Each name brings back sweet memories from gentle hugs to fisting. Excuse me as I try to keep my roving eye from misting. It took a while to keep the nerve to touch a naked man, but once I did, the, flood the floodgates cracked. Here's where it all began with Stan. And that's mm -hmm. again from the book of Lust. I... Love that. I really appreciate how you don't separate or didn't, at least with the bo your book here, about from boyfriends, tricks, and trysting. It all kind of goes together. You know, some people I feel are like, oh, that's a trick and totally separate from a relationship. Mm -hmm. Well, a lot of them had equal meaning to me. You know, like I, I could have been with a guy for one time and something happened or there's some connection made that really stuck with me. 
you know? So it wasn't just like a throwaway. Sometimes, yeah, sometimes absolutely a throwaway, but there were men that I met along the way that, um, like I tell the story about the guy that I met at that dance club in, in, um, Pittsburgh when I was in school and, you know, how I was just tricking with people that just didn't really like that story is not just there to say, Hey, I slept with this guy. That story is there to tell me about, to say about how judgmental I was about people's bodies, about masculinity and femininity, about, you know, I talk about how it used to take me like hours to actually get down to the deed when I would meet somebody because I'd feel like, well, I have to get to know them better, (laughs) you know? And so, and in that story, it's funny to me because I had met this guy at the bar. We'd spent all this time at the bar. It was really late. I went home with him and I was, you know, I was like, well, I just can't sleep with somebody. So I said to him, I said, you know, he was all set. He went and got himself into a caftan. I mean, we were, he was all (laughs) set. I couldn't, my friends know me. I have a whole joke thing about caftans. It's It's pretty funny. It's so hilarious to me. I love, yes. I make a name (laughs) reference. Mame, yes. Thank you, Mame. Yeah. The Lucille Ball version. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Him Not the better. Well, but then what was funny was, you know, it was so late and I just went, well, I'd like to, I'd like to maybe get to know you better. And he goes and he just throws himself on the Barca lounge or sits down and goes, what do you want to know? <laughs> <laughs> and so when you said it that way, I was like, I really guess I don't want to know anything, but I, you know, I asked a couple of questions and then I fucked him. So it was, you know, yeah. that's the way I did things back then. It's kind of a funny story. And it's just one of the many kind of like, you know, I'll say screwed up, but certain things I had in my head about sex and men that I just, you know, was hard to sort out. You know, and it was, and I wasn't comfortable talking about all this stuff early on. Now, you know, whatever you want to know, I'll tell you. Um, it's really a fun. I this is where I really related a lot to your writing in the book because I, seeing your trajectory of how you approach sex from not even thinking as a young and that it was possible for mm-hmm. to have sex with another man because obviously there was no examples. You didn't think it would ever happen. You talk about the pillow, I I relate to that, to later maybe wanting to approach it, but thinking that, oh, I would never want to suck a dick because that's dirty, Mm -hmm. and how could anybody do that, to, like my life, just the years, over the years, really uh, through circumstances expanding, you know, literally, and just my mind on what I want to try, and... I've gotten into the leather community in various forms and it's just really, I hope everybody kind of has like that growth factor on the possibilities of sex. Well, I think, you know, sometimes people limit themselves because they're afraid. Sometimes they limit because they don't know how to do it. Um, And not just afraid of like what might happen, but things like, you know, diseases and, and, you know, having like casual sex and some guy beating you up or something. I mean, you know, all that shit has gone through my head, believe me, because I'm somebody who's very, you know, careful about stuff. But I also knew that I was feeling really unfulfilled and feeling very um, like there was something inside of me that the world would not approve of. And yet I wanted so badly to explore it. And so when you're somebody who's, you know, who's a people pleaser and, you know, tries to be the good Jewish boy like I was, I was not inclined to go with those impulses. But certain things happened in life where I just kind of went, you know what? My desire to do it trumps my desire to be a good boy. Quote, good, unquote, boy. Yes. You know, And we should say that, you know, you do definitely talk about the AIDS uh, era Mm -hmm. and I could definitely, I didn't live in New York, but I definitely can relate to the fear that so many of us felt Mm -hmm. on just forget, you know, forget about sex, just getting tested. And um, I, you do a really good job of explaining that whole period and how, you still probably carry a lot of that. I think it was a traumatic time oh. if you were young and so many of us carry those memories. They don't go away. And if, not to mention the people and loved ones that you lost. Yeah. I think, you know, guys or anybody in that generation who dealt with AIDS, um, friends, you know, dying, friends getting sick, 
um, it, it is, it, it's, it's like scar tissue that won't leave. And I think some guys move on better from it than others do. I, it's still, it still is an issue with me and I still, you know, I continue to have safe sex and, um, I think about friends, like there was, I write about the story about Kalani in the book, the guy that I meet at the Columbia dance. And I kind of forgotten about him until I sat down to write the book, but he was one of the earliest people that I knew who died of AIDS. And when, because I was so in love with him and it was a very brief kind of flirtation that we had. But when I heard that he died, like a couple of years later, I read it in a magazine. I, my legs fell out from under me. I, oh, I mean, yeah. the pain, one day you're this like wonderfully beautiful, nice, sweet guy. And the next day you're gone. That's what happened. And, right. and I, I tell this story a lot, but when the movie, the normal heart came on HBO with Mark Ruffalo and Matt Bomer, I thought they did a really good job. And yet I talked to so many younger guys who didn't like the movie. They were like, oh, it was so over the top. It's like, no, oh. no, it was not. It was not. That's what it was like back then. About an epidemic, my God. Yeah, About it, no. yeah. And, and, you know, but, but it brought us closer together as a community because we all knew that we know nobody knew who was safe, you know, for until we kind of discovered really how it was transmitted. But it was a real tough time. But it was a brotherhood that I will never forget um, going yeah. through that with it, with the rest of my gay brothers and sisters, you know, as any actor knows, you know, when you've got a hit show and you're making money, then the, the next week it could totally turn around. And you through, you've always had a desire, if you will, to kind of want to explore that. And you do, and you call yourself an old older escort getting into it, but you're really in your thirties, correct? I was start? 36, but it was considered <laughs> to me that's young, but, that, but I know what you then mean. I was considered older. Um, you know, a lot of the guys who were escorting were in their twenties, you know, and in 2025 20, and that's, it seemed to be what people wanted, but this organ, this, um, um, agency was called maturity escorts specifically looking for older guys. Which is so fun to read because you talk about slice of life and getting in what <laughs> yeah, your life you. was like. Mo is your booker, I guess. Yeah, he <laughs> was my pimp, essentially. Your pimp? Yeah, your agent? I, I give, yeah, I give him a bunch of names and then it's like, whatever you want to call him, call him. I love that. <laughs> who, who essentially, you, the whole uh, audition process to get into his agency and then is a great read. I'll let people read that. But then you'll check in with All him. All true. All true. Okay. I love that. You, I love when you check in with him or he checks in with you. I've got a client. Um, there's a great story in there. We'll let people read where you fill in for somebody yep. that can't make it, who goes by the name of Reno, which probably wasn't his name either, which is hilarious. I mean, I mean, Reno, really? I know. And then, they, and then they, in, in the middle of it, they snag me because they got the, one of the guys was like, what's your name again? And I'm like, David, uh, Reno. Uh, Cause I forgot, you know, I was so it was the first time I'd ever done it. And it was with two guys. I was a nervous wreck, but I couldn't show that. And for me, after I got over the whole, like, Oh my God, I'm actually doing this. Right. I realized that everybody had different needs and being kind of like, you know, a little bit of a sex pig myself, but also a real caretaker kind of guy, an entertainer, um, a listener, um, just all the attributes that I feel I have as David Pevsner out in the world. I found that I needed to use those when I would have clients because not everybody wanted me to come in, fuck them and leave. Some guys yeah, didn't one guy want to have like martinis with you oh, and just talk for the full many hour. Many times, many times <laughs> I would go and we would sit and we would drink and talk. And he was just a really sweet guy. And sometimes it would end in sex and sometimes it was a kiss. And that was great. Thank you. You know, there yeah. were guys who like, you know, I remember one guy, um, I went to a hotel in Los Angeles and he I was having a hard time parking. So I was like, I don't know if I was texting. I said, I don't know if I'm going to get up there. He said, please do come up here. I really would like you to be here. So I went there and it was this guy and his wife had just died recently. Oh, wow. And he was struggling with his own thing, you know? And so he just, he wanted to experience some, some connection, you know, he wanted right. to live out his authentic life inside. Plus he had that, that pain and the sorrow, which, you know, I would never belittle, no matter who it is, best friend or, you know, 
guy I'm fucking in the in the bathhouse. You know, pain is real, and people act out on pain in, in many different ways. And sometimes I would get them as a cl- as a client after some you know kind of lousy thing that happened to them, or just if they were feeling lousy or bad about themselves. Um, some would even feel bad about hiring somebody. And so I was there to, to say like, no, this is great. We're going to have a great time, you know? And I love that. And usually when I would leave, they would be like, I'm really glad I did that. I feel, I feel much better. That's your job, your, your job, you, you, you know, as an <laughs> escort, that is your fucking job. Just like an actor, or anybody else, it's to make people feel better. Right. Yeah. The sooner you realize that as yeah. an escort, and, it, and obviously it's for the ob- the obvious ways sometimes like just a good pounding but uh, sometimes yep. it's but feel good doesn't always mean that it could mean like you said being there being Connect- empathetic connection. connecting yeah. yeah yeah that all encompasses f- of making somebody feel good and i'm glad you got that and yeah i think you, that's so- why i enjoyed it so much was because i didn't feel like first off i didn't feel like i was your typical male escort in that i wasn't like a big huge bodybuilder and i wasn't like you know a gorgeous face and you know i was kind of like a regular guy um and so i had insecurities about was i good enough for this but then as i found out as i went on that yeah I was good. I was better than good enough because I have a sensitivity and and a way to kind of turn an hour around in maybe a surprising way for the client, you know, or, or and as a listener to really know like, okay, David, shut up now. This guy needs to <laughs> he needs to vent, so let him do it, you know. Whatever. I love that. Yeah. The only thing I'll say ageism wise, because I do get a lot of young guys who approach me or, you know, on Scruff or I get messages on OnlyFans from younger guys and stuff. That, that it's, it's nice knowing that, like, as I try to tell older guys who think that they're done and nobody wants them and guys their own age won't even look at them. I'm like, well, there are guys out there who like older guys. So yeah. you can't you can't give up and you can't decide that you're redundant because you're not. You're only redundant if you make yourself that way. So I, to me, I'm finding that like one thing I don't I usually won't do, though, is like I won't necessarily come on to a younger guy unless I know that they're interested because I still right. don't want that look like, ugh, grandpa, get away from me. <laughs> you know, that's right. still that still does not feel great, but it rolls off my back because whatever, you know. Yeah, Um. I yeah, but there's a lot of people who feel defeated by their age and I don't want them to. I want them to know that they're still vital, that they're still, you know, there's still people out there for them if they are looking. And even if you're not looking, there's things you can do sexually that maybe you never did before, you know, that maybe you were scared of doing to kind of put a little zing into your sex life or finding somebody who likes that kind of thing and goes, oh, let's do it together, you know? This is why people need to read Damn Shame because you really do a good job of just that point of encouraging and and pivoting into today. You're still writing material, it's music, and your acting career is still thriving. But I was really happy that although you're not escorting anymore, you have an OnlyFans page? I do. I okay, do. now tell us. And where can people find it? Okay, well... Um... I st- well, first of all, I've been posing for photos for years and years and years. You have like a body of work. <laughs> I, I do have a body of work because it's been, you know, 20 plus And a hot body years. too, I might add. Well, it's, you're I very was, kind. Yes, Thank you. no. <laughs> and I had started, um, and they were all kind of living in photographer's notebooks and on JPEGs and stuff. But when Tumblr came along, I started posting photos. I had a bl- I be- uh, created a blog called Shameless. And I started to put the, these photo sets together and started posting them. And that was like, and I would try to be creative about it and try to be artsy and sometimes just blatantly triple X, whatever. Um, and I did that for five years until Tumblr purged adult material. So then I moved it all to OnlyFans, not charging a subscription because it's what I did at Tumblr. And then, and I started to shoot some videos um, for a, a filmmaker friend of mine, Faye Films. And we shot a couple of erotic videos and I was really enjoying it, but I just didn't kind of know where they would go. And he was going to be part of a festival that was showing little sex films. So I was like, great, use that. Well, then lockdown came along and COVID. And I thought, wow, 
here's what I'm going to do. This is what I've always wanted to do. I want to post the videos we're making, but I don't want to do it so that any looky-loo who's going to come and judge it can do that. Even though the photos were always out there for people to do the same. But right. the video made me feel a little more. But that's um, a little vulnerable. more, and in the business of tiered business, where you can, you know, charge a little something for a little more. Well, that's what I decided to do, and so um, in March of last year, I turned my OnlyFans into a subscription page, and ever since then, I've been creating videos and photo photo sets, and I do like role play stuff. I do some, every so often a duo or a trio, um, a DIY sex toys. Um, I do all kinds of stuff. And what I've found lately that I really enjoy is telling behind the scenes stories of the videos or taking a photo and either telling what actually happened in the photo or making up a really spicy, filthy, dirty little story about it. Um, I'm just kind of putting my that brain that I've always had, that kind of sexual, you know, creative, kind of creative dogs, like I do with anything else I would do as a writer or an actor to really kind of like delve deep into the moment. And I write those stories and people seem to really like them. And I love writing them. Um, I've done, I've done audio books where I've done people's um, uh, gay erotica where I've narrated them. And I love doing it because I love talking about sex. I love thinking about sex. I love writing about sex. And I'm finding that OnlyFans has become this like multi-tiered um, ability for me. Sometimes the videos are very kind of artsy and esoteric, and sometimes it's like here I am getting fucked. I mean, it, it, it's it's kind of it runs the gamut. But I I'm so proud of the creativity that I've brought to it. It's not I don't think it's like I won't say it's like not like anybody else's page because I don't know that for sure. But I know right. that I'm doing it my way. And that everything I put up there has some other element besides just sex. There's humor or you know, creativity or emotion or um, storytelling. And it's been really fun. So it's OnlyFans.com slash RealGuyLA. Love it. And I don't, right, use, always... I, I don't use my name there because it, when I first set up the OnlyFans, I was like, well, I said David Pevsner on the Tumblr page, but... This is going to be a little more intense. So I use the name that I like have on hookup sites, Real Guy LA. Yeah. But over the, you know, the past year and stuff, I'm kind of like, you know, I should really change it, but I can't really do that right now. Um, because I'm, I have no shame about it. The only thing I do say about what I post is I don't like sometimes when people maybe steal them and put them elsewhere. Because right. I, I'm not making this material for the people who want to like be the looky loos and go, oh, look at that. I'm not making it for them. I'm making it for the people who want to see it. You know? Absolutely. And that's the basis. Yeah, I think you're doing the right thing. And you, I'm glad that OnlyFans is copyrighted. So you own the material. Yeah, and, but, it, it, you know, yeah. sometimes people do what they're do not supposed anyway. to do. And, yeah. and I, I don't really, it's not that I care about the fact that this is the way I'm making a living and it's not fair for you to take it away from me for free. But right. I also feel like, you know, if something makes it out there, I used to feel like, oh, no, now the whole world, all these judgy people now. I don't care. Come at me. Tell me what you think about it. But let's have the conversation. Why does it bother you so much? You know, why is it why, you know, just why does sexuality? It's just so, you know, it's, it's such an, a conversation to have that we're not having. You know, right. well, we really in depth, really in depth. I'm talking. All right. Coming in with our favorite special guest, our last one of 2022 is Uncle B, who's going to be talking about testosterone. So many great things. It's a recent episode, so you can visit the full episode if you like. But here's some of the top moments of that interview. Here is Uncle B. If you don't take care of yourself, what ends up happening? I mean, if we had a chart, you know, we're looking at um, guys who are starting in their 20s and everything is fine. You know, you're going along and like with everything else in your body, things start dipping. Um, for men, typically you're losing 1% of testosterone per year. Um, okay. When that starts, it's sort of up to you, but how you accelerate it is definitely up to you. So you could end up like like we were saying before, just eating the cheese pizzas, the the burgers, doing all the different things you're not supposed to do, staying out late, <laughs> you know, doing all, you know, we we all we all have done it. I've done it myself, yes. uh, especially with uh, the alcohol and things like that. You start yeah. going down, 
and you hit a certain point where you're like, okay, um, are you going too far in terms right. of your level of, of health? So if your testosterone is going down, um, your human growth hormone, you're not taking care of yourself, you get into a situation which we call the downward spiral. Mm -hmm. And that's where everything adds up. So you put on a little weight, it's right there in your stomach. And you know, that it affects your testosterone in terms of turning your testosterone into estrogen um, through a process mm -hmm. called aromatase. Um, your um, you start developing other different diseases that also slow things down. Your body is slowing down anyway. As you get older, it becomes harder to sleep. Um, mm -hmm. It becomes harder to uh, produce more testosterone. Uh, it becomes harder to lose weight. It just becomes everything <laughs> becomes right. harder. And so you don't want to get into that situation where you start losing your erections and you can hit a point where it becomes more and more difficult to come back. It's a, like imagine... Uh, trying to climb a hill and go over a wall at the same time that's on the hill. Oh, okay. Um, and when it comes to our food, when you walk into the grocery store, you have one aisle that's full of food that's good for you, the produce mm -hmm. aisle. Everything else is bad. I mean, because of two reasons. One, it's designed to stay on the shelves for a long period of time. So when you eat it, it stays in your body for an excess period of time. Um, and also, you know, we're basically wet bags. You know, we're warp with 50 percent, 50 to 60 percent water. So mm -hmm. everything else in the grocery store is dry. So we're taking right. dry stuff and sticking oh. it into our bodies. And so when they talk about drinking water, um, I just found out that I'm chronically dehydrated. So I had to start drinking a lot more water. I thought I was doing yeah. good, but, you know, I got an electric scale. The scale was able to tell me that my water was lower. So, you know, oh. technology can help. Um, but if you don't know what's going on, if you don't measure it, then you can't test it and you run into issues. And definitely with the exercise, um, some people take things too far. Well, I always say, you know, people, you know, say I'm anti jogging or something like that. I'm not that it's just recognize what you're trying to accomplish. So a marathon runner is not going to train the same way as a bodybuilder. So mm -hmm. if you're trying to get your testosterone up, you have to do certain workouts like lifting heavy, um, like doing high intensity interval training. If you're doing something like steady state cardio for too long of a period, you're just sitting there on the on the bike for hours, uh, getting on the elliptical for hours, just jogging for hours. You're actually wearing down your testosterone. Uh, so you just need to be aware of that. I'm not against jogging. Just be aware that if you're trying to increase your testosterone, you have to pay attention to that. So, yeah, definitely the thing about um, penis enlargement is something that uh, men should know about, period. And the reason is because it uh, is just, well, it's the opposite end of it is penis atrophy. Uh, you imagine someone who's uh, 81 um, and imagine when that person was 21. Is there a difference in their penis size? Ask their nurse. It'll let you know. It's like, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so if you're... Um, so, yeah, there is a process, you know, when we, uh, let me just um, dive into the, the sexual performance scale right quick. And that's the scale of one to 10. 10 means everything works. One means you need to go to the hospital. Uh, five okay. to seven is most guys who I deal with who are just unreliable um, in terms of if you're at a seven, you know, it. You're sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. Um, six is more of that. And a five, it takes a lot of uh preparation, <laughs> a lot of things to happen in order for you to have an, an erection. Um, and sometimes it'll leave during sex. So uh, you really want to, you know, know where you are and continuously right. go up this scale because uh, as you get older, and we're talking about blood flow, as you get older, I mean, think about, a, imagine a person who's older, well, what is one about them? They're moving slower. It's right. like, well, yeah, your blood flow is moving slower also. So you want to keep your blood moving. You want to keep working out. You want to keep moving, period. And, yes. you know, fortunately for men, we just happen to have an indicator stick that's right in the middle of our body that lets us know <laughs> how we're doing. Um, and one of the things to realize in terms of the penis itself is that um, the, the veins in there, the capillaries, uh, the, is the smallest in the body. So we're talking right. about one uh, platelet of blood going through at a time. So right. you want to be very care careful. That's the reason why they call it the uh, canary in the coal mine. If you have erection issues, that means there are other issues going on throughout the body. It's just that it shows up in your penis. 
uh, first. Ah, that's the so, last moment, I guess, that you're seeing it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so when you're um, in terms of penis enlargement on that scale, you need to be eight, nine or 10. And so you're, uh, you know, you're already at a healthy stage. Um, and basically, when we talk about penis enlargement, you're not going to, you know, go from I'm a size four, I'll be size 12 tomorrow. It, right. None of that works. It's, you know, those crazy Darn. commercials. <laughs> But uh, in terms of, you know, for most guys, they're 20 to 30 percent smaller than they normally would be just because of what we do. Sit around, you know, sitting on the couch, not really moving, all the different things that add up to you're not functioning at your best. So uh, if you're able to take care of yourself correctly, you get to the eight, nine or 10, then you can be at the largest that you can possibly be. So that's it. Well, I hope you enjoyed the three interviews with Brian Madigan, David Pevsner, and of course, Uncle B, some of my favorite guests of 2022 for Tags Podcast. We're going to be having a lot more special guests in 2023. Stay tuned for that. Wishing everybody a very happy New Year celebration, New Year's Day. And of course, we're back with all new episodes beginning January 3rd, so check us out. You can follow the show at Tags Podcast on all social media platforms at Tags Podcast. I'm talking about Twitter, Instagram. Go to tagspodcast.com for all good things, Tags Podcast. And in the meantime, continue having hot gay sex.